tonight. The city lowering its minimum wage. Migrants toil under a plastic sea. And shredding for glory on the air guitar circuit. It's basically like porn. You know it when you see it. Christopher Cantwell has been denied bail on charges stemming from his actions at the white nationalist protest in Charlottesville two weeks ago. Cantwell, who spoke with Vice News extensively over the course of that weekend, turned himself in late on Wednesday. He's being held on three felony charges, including the illegal use of tear gas. Cantwell will remain in police custody in Virginia pending a court hearing in October. In a landmark decision, India's Supreme Court ruled that citizens have a fundamental right to privacy. The unanimous ruling is a major blow to the government's push for a vast biometric identification program that's been criticized for privacy infringement. The program, mandatory for things like receiving benefits, filing tax returns, and opening bank accounts, has already collected iris scans and digital fingerprints from more than one billion Indians. Qatar is restoring diplomatic relations with Iran in defiance of one of the key demands made by Saudi Arabia and other Arab nations that imposed a blockade on the tiny country in June. Qatar withdrew its ambassador from Iran in solidarity with Saudi Arabia last year, when the kingdom's embassy was looted by Iranian protesters. But the envoy will now return to Tehran to resume full relations. The Navy has identified the body of the sailor killed after Sunday's collision between the USS John S. McCain and an oil tanker. Divers found 22-year-old Kenneth Aaron Smith's remains while searching the flooded compartments of the ship. A search and rescue operation in the surrounding waters has been suspended, but divers will continue to search the ship for the nine sailors who are still missing. Washington State is asking fishermen to catch as many Atlantic salmon as they can after a farming pen holding more than 300,000 fish broke open. Thousands of non-native Atlantic salmon were released into the sea, raising concerns about the effect they may have on the native Pacific salmon. The company that runs the fish farm said exceptionally high tides coinciding with the solar eclipse caused the damage. But environmentalists said the pens should be built to withstand the tidal movements. Across the country, cities have been pushing the minimum wage up towards levels full-time workers can actually live on. St. Louis was one of them. But on Monday, the city's going to backtrack, lowering the minimum wage from $10 an hour to $7.70, reversing a city-mandated increase that happened just three months ago. It's actually very stressful. Not having enough. Not having enough for rent. Um, paying extra and late fees because you lay on rent because you don't have enough money to pay rent on time. Stuff like that, it add up. Money has never come easy for Myron Barbie. Just a few months ago, he was working days at a hotel as a cook and nights at Schnucks, a 24-hour grocery store. Then, in early May, the city of St. Louis raised the minimum wage from $7.70 to $10. That still meant someone working full-time would make only $400 a week or a little more than $20,000 a year before taxes. But the extra money was significant for Myron. I saw my check. I saw a big difference made on my check. So I decided to quit my job at the hotel. My new plan was to go to school. I was an IT um, certification class I was doing to um, secure my future. But after just two weeks of classes, he learned his raise was only going to last for another month. How did you find out? Um, through a letter posted in our break room. So one day you just went into yep. work and there was a letter posted in the break room? No one talked nope. to you about it? Has anyone talked to you about it no. at this point? No. Just two months after the left-leaning city raised its pay floor, the Republican-held state passed a bill that prohibited all city-specific minimum wage increases, undermining years of work by local officials. Despite what liberals would tell you, it was actually taking money out of people's pockets. I mean, uh, these laws actually do the reverse of what they're intended to do. St. Louis's mayor, Lada Krusen, isn't happy the state decided to step in. When someone like the governor says, increasing the minimum wage is bad for our economy, we will lose jobs, we'll lose business, mm -hmm. how do you respond to that? 
in the state of Missouri we have a minimum wage which is seven dollars and seventy cents clearly that is not enough money to support a family on or even yourself at the national level there's always a big um, uh, rhetoric about pushing things down to the state level but clearly it stops there are you saying that it's hypocritical of Republicans or the right to want local control until it doesn't suit them or it doesn't fall in line with their interests? I'm saying it's interesting. What works in St. Louis, Missouri, a, a dense urban area, may not be the exact same law that we need in most smaller towns. Most economists today would say that there is a point at which the minimum wage is so high that it starts to hurt not only businesses but even workers because it encourages companies to cut back on jobs and hours. But many businesses in St. Louis think $10 an hour isn't high enough to do that. I can't believe the politicians wouldn't say, okay, they passed this $10 minimum. Let's see how it goes over the next couple of years. Joe Edwards is a St. Louis native. He's built a mini empire of quirky small businesses along one of the city's most popular strips. And he employs about 400 people. Joe's sticking with $10. There's a group in St. Louis called Save the Rays and I've talked with them, and they're going around talking to most businesses, small businesses in St. Louis, and finding out, are you gonna put it back to 770, or are you gonna leave it at 10? And the last time I talked to them, 92% of small businesses were gonna leave it at 10. That's astounding, that's wonderful. Why is it important to you that other businesses in St. Louis pay more than the 770 minimum wage? I, I think the business that pay more will do better, both employees and customers, because they would get better customer service. They would get more knowledgeable customer service. If it's a restaurant, they would know all about the menu and the drink specials and the ingredients that go into it. That's priceless. Not every company in St. Louis sees it that way. Many larger national and regional chains are expected to roll back their wages, including Schnucks, where Myron expects to make around eight fifty an hour again. If you're living check to check right now when you're making ten sixty, how are you going to do it when you're making eight dollars or eight fifty? I'm on. I'm finally. A lot of my clothes are more permanent. They've been for almost ten plus years already. To me, it's sad because I don't want that. I don't. Um, I love working so just I don't see that as a full time, twenty plus year thing for me. This is not my calling. I know I can do much more and better, but I want to give more, be more in life. In his short time in office, President Trump has already established a pattern make off-the-cuff statements or tweets about policy, and then leave the details for someone else to figure out. Last month, for instance, Trump tweeted that he planned to ban transgender soldiers, but only now is the administration setting a time limit for the military to make that plan workable. You can see the same pattern at work in Trump's response to the opioid epidemic. A couple of weeks ago, he gathered reporters at his golf club in New Jersey to talk about the crisis. The opioid crisis is an emergency, and I'm saying officially right now, it is an emergency. It's a national emergency. We're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money on the opioid crisis. Declaring an emergency was one of the key recommendations from the president's special commission on opioids. But while Trump said the opioid crisis was an emergency, he didn't actually declare it an emergency. In order to do that, the president first has to issue a formal declaration, send it to Congress, and then have it published in the Federal Register. It's not a big, long, complicated thing. There are clear criteria, and he can simply trigger the process. Congress doesn't have to pass a law or a resolution in any way. It is within the sole power of the president of the United States. Trump hasn't done any of that, as the White House confirmed to Vice News this week. That's important, because when it comes to the opioid crisis, a formal declaration might make a big difference. It could lift a Medicaid ban on funding for drug treatment and rehab facilities with more than 16 beds, and allow the Secretary of Health and Human Services to negotiate cheaper prices for overdose antidotes like naloxone. A formal emergency could also release Medicaid funds to treat the opioid addiction raging through the prison system. 
and it could let authorities get their hands on money from the Federal Disaster Relief Fund. But for any of that to happen, Trump will have to do something he's struggled with, turn words into action. For members of Congress, the August recess is the season for facing down voter anger at town hall meetings. And this summer, Democratic fury over President Trump is enough to keep many Republicans effectively in hiding, but not all of them. Despite the amateurism in the White House, the Senate is still full of hardened political veterans, and they know how to take a tough question or two. Chuck Grassley is one of the few Republican senators publicizing and holding town halls this month. Uh, thank you all for coming. He's been in the Senate since 1981, and he doesn't scare easily, even when it comes to a town hall organized by Democrats. I imagine uh, maybe a fourth or a half of you have been to town meetings before. You can ask me personal questions if you want to. In fact, Grassley has made it a point of pride to visit all of Iowa's 99 counties every year to hold town halls, like this one in Mount Air, where about 73 people showed up on Wednesday. Together or earlier today in Bedford with about 90 people. I got here a couple minutes early. I hope you aren't shocked. <laughs> You'd expect with so many Democrats in both audiences, there'd be a lot of shouting or booing, but the voters here rewarded their senator's good faith by keeping almost all of their questions focused on what he could actually do. Uh, we've had one person die this month, and I fear more uh, will come unless we begin to speak out against this and have ways to counter it. I guess I come with imploring you that the Judicial Committee should have uh, hearings on this rise of this uh, cancer among us. We've already had two hearings this fall, hopefully yet during September, we will have uh, the Attorney General before our committee for an annual, what we call an annual oversight hearing. And it's obviously something that's going to come up very much during that hearing as well. Go ahead. His answers weren't always satisfying, but they seem to be enough. I have voted for him, even though I've been a lifelong Democrat. What did you think about his answer to you? I felt like he heard me, uh, although it was all about the past. Well, we've had this hearing and we've had that hearing, and I really would like for him to have said that, yeah, we'll, we'll do another hearing. There's no question that Donald Trump makes Chuck Grassley's life harder. But as we watched in both towns, he was able to diffuse his constituents' anger by being clear, straightforward, and knowing his stuff. Senate Judiciary Committee staff members met for 10 hours. I would like to know what they discovered in that meeting, and I would like the transcripts released. Will you do that? Yeah. The answer is, uh, it'll t I, it take a vote of the committee to do it. We can't release it until we give uh, Simpson and his lawyer a copy of it. I asked you if you would vote to release the transcripts. Will you personally vote yeah. for the release of the transcripts? I don't know why I wouldn't, but I don't want to say so. I've never gone through this process before, so I'm not going to answer your question until I get a firm footing of what the precedent is. Almost every Republican run on a replaced Obamacare. Yeah. You haven't done it. When's it going to happen? Uh, those of us who are paying almost 20000 a year for health insurance want it done. When we get one more vote. <laughs> Why don't we have that one more vote? Uh, because of... I think the senators are playing games, Senator. Well, I'm not playing games. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, this is my son, Elliot. <laughs> Elliot has Down syndrome. He's had a pre-existing condition since conception. Can you look at this little guy and say you were thinking about people like him? when you voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act? Uh, the answer is yes, very definitely. And uh, and I, based on, on that would be the fact that the changes that were going to be made in Medicaid, or even, even the private health insurance, wouldn't affect the pre-existing conditions. But what I'm telling you now really is not an issue because we didn't get the votes to pass anything in the United States Senate. Even Laura, who volunteers for the local Democratic Party, acknowledges Grassley's ability to keep cool. Do you think there is an asset to Iowans because he is as good of a politician as he is? I do think so. I think so. He, he was able to come have a town hall and no one was yelling and shouting and we were able to hear each other. 
Voters left both events we attended still feeling frustrated with DC, but not really frustrated with their senator. It helps explain why Grassley's been able to stick around for so long, and why even in the face of a weakened Republican presidency, some in his own party aren't feeling as much pressure as you might think they are. This year, the number of migrants arriving in Spain has more than tripled to 8,000. Most are using a route the country has tolerated for decades, which serves as a low-wage labor pipeline for places like El Mar de Plástico, known as the largest concentration of greenhouses in the world. The Plastic Sea supplies much of the fresh produce sold in European supermarkets, but there's a steep human cost to cheap salad. Almeria's $2 billion vegetable industry is a stark contrast to the neighboring coastal resorts where 10 million tourists holiday annually. There are 100,000 acres of greenhouses here, visible from space, producing more than 3.5 million tons of fruit and vegetables for supermarkets in Northern and Western Europe. It's powered by an army of 120,000 migrant workers, up to half of them illegal, and living in squalid settlements close to the greenhouses where they work in temperatures well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Jose Garcia, a union worker, tours these slums, trying to inform workers of their rights. Locals often hail the Plastic Sea as an economic miracle in a desert region once known only as a location for spaghetti westerns. But few people outside this region are aware of the conditions. The camps have no toilets, no running water, and only sporadic electricity supply. These settlements, in the heart of the European Union, look more like war zone refugee camps. Mohamed Asali has worked in the greenhouses since arriving by boat from North Africa in 2005. His testimony about illegal payments is typical of thousands of workers. Pagan solamente 32 euros por cada 8 horas de trabajo. Y vamos trabajando en bajo condiciones, bajo malas condiciones. Y falsifican la nómina. El trabajador recibe esta hoja y le dan un boli y hace esta firma. Aquí está el cuadrante de los días trabajados. Y ellos cuando llegan a la oficina ponen lo que quieren. Y si hablamos de eso, la respuesta es si quieres trabajar o bien a tu casa y denuncia. Local authorities told us the European Union and the Spanish government have allowed the site to expand exponentially, fueled by illegal labor, in order to meet demand from supermarket suppliers. Farmers, meanwhile, often the first accused for mistreatment of workers, blame supermarkets and consumers for squeezing production costs. Jose Antonio Lopez Vargas, who runs a small independent farm not accused of any wrongdoing, says the prices paid for vegetables have stayed the same for a decade. Yo el problema lo veo más en, en las grandes explotaciones donde el agricultor ya no conoce a los trabajadores y, y te da pena de que la gente no se ponga en el, en el pellejo de, de aquel que ha llegado a trabajar a la finca y también te sientes muy mal cuando tal, todo lo que te ha pedido el mercado lo has cumplido y no te pagan lo que para poder vivir. In written statements, the European Union said the Spanish government must ensure it enforces the law, while the Spanish government referred us to local authorities and said its inspections are, quote, appropriate. What are you doing with a school bag on stage? You can't even read. He's boxing big and I bitch. always come out on top. The fucking fans can't fight for if you. If you believe in yourself, like you say you believe in yourself, bitch, your whole fight check, you bitch. 
This weekend, undefeated veteran boxer Floyd Mayweather is facing off against MMA star Conor McGregor in a fight being described as both a publicity stunt and the biggest sporting event of the year. Most boxing fans think it's a foregone conclusion that Mayweather will win. So to attract more action, casinos are offering sideshow bets called prop bets. Instead of betting on who wins or loses, you can place wagers on whether the fighters will touch gloves, whether there'll be a knockdown before the fifth round, or whether either fighter will lose his protective mouthpiece. You can also bet on sillier things. You can make a so-called over-under bet on whether President Trump will tweet seven or more times during the fight. You can bet on whether Demi Lovato will sing the national anthem in under a minute 54 or whether rapper Lil Wayne will be wearing a shirt if he shows up. Prop bets used to be small time, but they've become big business, with billions wagered on them every year. So even if the side bets make even more of a mockery out of Mayweather McGregor, the bookies will be laughing all the way to the bank. Tomorrow night in Finland, thousands will gather for championships of a niche sport, air guitar. Part cosplay and part showing off for friends, competitive air guitar is a pursuit with a uniquely dedicated following. DC! Welcome to the U.S. Air Guitar National Championship! At the U.S. National Air Guitar Finals, 22 people compete for a chance to represent their country at Worlds. These are the best of the best in air guitar. In 2013, Doug the Thunderstruck was one of them. That year, he was the second best air guitarist in the world. Now he runs competitive air guitar for the entire U.S. It's a bit of a weird hobby. Every time I tell someone I do this, they're like, what? The moment you get up on stage and you are an instant rock star, it's like the thrill of it is, is amazing. Yes, it's what it looks like. Adults playing dress up with spandex, face glitter, and imaginary guitars. And air guitars take it seriously. What are they judging you on? So there's three criteria. The uh, first criteria is uh, technical. So like, does it look like you are playing along with the music? The second part is stage presence. Like, do you use the whole stage? And then the third one is called airness. And airness is a je ne sais quoi of, of air guitar. It's basically like porn. You know it when you see it. And so when the Dark Horse competition happens in DC, the last chance for air guitarists to qualify for nationals, competition is fierce. One of those competitors is Athena Kapsidis. She's a first grade teacher at a DC public school, but on stage, she calls herself Shreddy Boop. Shreddy Boop is really polite and dainty, and she loves to wear lots of makeup and just make sure her nails are done, but she'll also, um, you know, rip your heart out. This is Shreddy Boop's costume, and it's actually a traditional Greek dance costume how much of her is a bigger version of you? My costume is actually something that's been passed down to me from my family. I've, I've tweaked it a little bit. So when I put it on, I feel like it's me, you know, but in a different way. I think there's a lot of sweetness that Shreddy Boop offers. But when the music comes on, she's just really fierce and sexual and sensual and um, unapologetic. I was diagnosed with anxiety about 10 years ago. And so all these years when I thought that it it just wasn't me to do something like this. It actually wasn't me. It was just a matter of me figuring out how to look past the anxiety and work through it. Not only did Treddy work through it, she won one of the last few spots at Nationals. But here, it's the big leagues of air guitar. And the judges can be tough. You don't need to objectify yourself to rock. You're hurting somebody. I'm making it stronger. Women? <laughs> but even without a win, Treddy keeps coming back. You're definitely doing next year, though. Oh, yeah. That's the thing about air guitar. Anybody can be a rock star. 
In fact, the eventual winner, the person representing the U.S. at the World Championship, wasn't the heaviest shredder. They didn't have the longest hair or the flashiest costume. It was a 30-something mother of two from suburban Chicago called Mom Jeans Genie. It shouldn't be about winning. It's like everybody's so great. It's like everybody's having so much fun. That's the fun part. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, August 24th. Tune in tomorrow night for the award-winning documentary series, Vice. There is no fear anymore. This is a citizen's revolution. You can feel it on the streets. They're shooting marbles at the kids now. Yo les juro que voy a dedicar toda mi vida para que esta revolución 